Uh, good to see you. As you heard, my name is Cephas, and um, I'm part of the eldership team that um, oversees one tribe. And um, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, Karibu Tena, let me just add our welcome to you. It's uh, great to have you with us. There are many wonderful churches across the city that you could have been, and so we count it a privilege that you've uh, come to be with us this morning. And uh, you've joined us at a, at a great time. We've been going through a series called Good to Grow. Uh, it's a three-part series, and today I'm doing the last part. And uh, uh, Mbonisi kicked us off about uh, two weeks ago, and he was talking about being wholehearted. And the premise of the series is that when you follow Jesus, when you raise your hand, when you get baptized and say, I want to follow Jesus, the goal is not just to get you safely to heaven safely to the afterlife. The goal is not even to help you just live a good life today, but actually the goal is that you would become fruitful, that you would grow and mature to become more like Christ. It's what Peps was talking about when she uh, gave this picture of being pruned. And Jesus was actually the one who gave that picture and said, He is the vine and we are the branches. And, and the Father prunes. He's kind of like a gardener about our lives, uh, looking at how He can help us to bear more fruit. And it says it's for His glory that we be more fruitful. And this is what this series is all about. So Bonisi kicked us off talking about following Jesus wholeheartedly. He mentioned many reasons why we could uh, turn to Jesus and say, but first, I just need to work on these few things in my life. And Bonisi was urging us to take all those things and relegate them. He spoke about cash, he spoke about career, he spoke about culture, and he called us to put Christ first, follow him wholeheartedly. And I wasn't here last week. Uh, we were in South Africa for the advanced conference, this movement of churches that we're part of, and uh, it was great to be with other leaders from uh, across Africa, and the theme of the conference was Kosi Sikelela Africa, God bless Africa, and we're praying for you. But uh, I got to listen to Catherine's wonderful message from last week, where she was talking about be blessed. She spoke from a passage where, where Jesus calls us to be servants. He, he, call, he, he calls us to follow this upside, down, this upside down way of the kingdom, that the path to greatness is actually through service. And uh, Catherine gave us such wonderful practical ways that we can be servants. She told us we, we can be servants of, of God, we can be servants of one another, but also we're called to be servants of the world. And this is all based and built on living our lives by receiving the great servant himself, the one who served us by dying for us on the cross. You see, the message is not do better, try harder, but the message is receive what Christ has done for you and become all that he calls you to be. And this morning, I'll be talking about community because community is the medium through which God chooses to grow us. I would liken the importance of community to that of the soil for plants. You see, it's, it's the soil that kind of anchors the roots. It's the soil that gives the medium through which the nutrients are passed on to the roots. And this is how community is in the life of the believer. It, it keeps us anchored, and it's through community that God builds us up. So if you have your Bibles, please would you turn with me to Matthew 18. We'll be reading from verse 15. And I want to just put all my cards on the table and tell you what I'll be talking about. From this passage, we're going to see two reasons why you should take church community more seriously. Then we're going to look at three reasons why being in church community might be tough for you. And then we'll see that actually, even though church community might be tough, there's no opt-out button. You can't opt out of it. And then finally, we'll see two promises for us as we engage in community. But before we do that, let me pray. Father, we thank you for gathering us this morning. Thank you that we're not here on our own initiative, out of our own accord, but you're the one who's gathering us from the nations, from the tribes, from all peoples of the earth. 
Thank you for the words of encouragement that we heard this morning. That you prune us. You call us to be free of things that would hold us back. You call us from things that might promise us life, but actually are deadly. That you call us to spread our wings before you. That we would live not out of our own resources, out of our own strength or power, but we would live out of the resources and the strength that you give. And so this morning, Lord, we want to open your word and ask that you'd speak to us. Ask that you'd continue to prune us. Ask that you would continue to charge us and invigorate us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we just don't want to have a good sermon, but we want to encounter the living God. We want to hear from you. And so would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to us as a church. If you agree with that, why don't you just say amen. amen. All right, we're in Matthew 18. We'll be jumping into verse 15. Here we go. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he doesn't listen to you, ignore it. You've tried your best. No, take one or two more with you. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he doesn't listen, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that, may, that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. That is the word of the Lord. I think you're supposed to say amen at that point. <laughs> now, this passage... It's quite important when we talk about church and talk about community because it's one of only two passages we have in the Gospels that has the word church. So we need to pay attention to what it's talking about. And in the first instance, it's also in the book of Matthew. You meet it in Matthew chapter 16, uh, that famous story when Jesus asks his disciple, who do people say I am? And then he brings it to them, who do you say I am? And uh, this is the most important question that you will ever answer in your life. And uh, we know Peter responded on behalf of the disciples, said, you are the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the hope of Israel, the, the one who Israel has been waiting for, who would fulfill all the promises of God, who would bring the kingdom, destroy evil, and, and, and bring the last days. The Son of God. And Peter, and then Jesus responds and said, hey, this hasn't been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but it's something that God himself has revealed to you. And I say, you're Peter, and on this rock, I'll, I'll build my church. And that's the first instance we, we see the word church mentioned in the whole New Testament. And from that, we, we, we see that the church is this community, this community that is built on the rock of the gospel, that is built on this new thing that God is doing. Jesus could have said, hey, I will rebuild the nation of Israel. I, I will destroy the powers of Rome. I will destroy the powers of evil. I will usher in the last days. But he says, no, I will build my church. This community, this people called to belong to him. This people who, who himself he has, he has washed, he has, he has cleansed, who he has called individually. And he says, this is what it means for me to be the Messiah. This is what it means for God to have sent me, that I am building my community. We heard earlier this year when, when Sean spoke about the church, he, he, he said it's, it's a people of the Father, this family of God, a bride for the Son and a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, I will build my church And I said, I'll, I'll, I'll give us two reasons why we should talk about 
and why we should look at the church community more seriously. Well, the first thing is that Jesus takes the church community very seriously. This is Jesus' personal project. And so when, when we come into this passage, Jesus is giving what we might call a standard operating procedure, an, an SOP about how to have reconciliation in the church. He, he takes it so seriously, he doesn't leave it to chance. He doesn't just say, hey, if your brother sins against you, just, just be led of the Spirit. Just, just kind of figure it out. I'll send my Holy Spirit. You guys will, will have the scriptures. You have one another. Just figure it out. No, no. He says, my church is so important that when there's discord, when, when, when there's sin, when, when relationships are broken, I want you to follow this process because my church is important to me. In fact, this story is sandwiched between one where he gives this, the story of the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep and goes and finds the lost one. And then at the end of it, he's, he gives this illustrated warning about unforgiveness, where he tells this story about the unforgiving servant. And what Jesus is saying is that he's the one who's building this community one person at a time. But not only that, the relationships between the members of the community, the relationships between his sheep matter. Listen to what he said to his disciples when he was looking forward to, to dying on the cross, when he was kind of giving his final words to, to strengthen them. Listen to what he says. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, loving one another wasn't a new commandment. It's there in Leviticus. But he says, even as I have loved you. That, that's what makes the difference. That Jesus came and set a new bar. He, he set a new standard of what it means to love one another. And he says that you also love one another. By this man, all men will know that you are my disciples. Imagine if, if you could finish that verse. By this, all men will know you're my disciples. How would you finish it? Well, by, by, by the miracles, right? We, we want to be known as Jesus' disciples by the great works of power. We, we want to be known as Jesus' disciples by how excellently we do, how we prosper in our lives, how we, how we prosper in our marriages, how we prosper in our work. We, we want to know we're Jesus' disciples by, by having amazing venues, having amazing worship, just doing all things well. We, we want to be known as, as Jesus' disciples by our liturgy, the, the religious things that we do, how well we pray, how, how much we can memorize the Bible and recite it. No, no, Jesus says, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Why? Because Jesus takes church community seriously. And I want to ask you this morning, how seriously do you take church community? Is it an optional extra? Is it that, that thing that you put on your to-do list under that red dot and line that says, if I can get to it, I will. But it's, it's not number one priority. If I can, I'll slot it in. But Jesus says, hey, this is how all men will know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. A second reason why we need to take church community more seriously is that the church community is meant to be a 3D illustration of the gospel. Now when we start in our passage, we see that it's, it's talking about reconciliation. Your brother has sinned against you, go show him his fault in private, if it listens to you, you have won your brother. That's, that's the goal, winning the brother. It's maintaining, deepening relationships. And it's an illustration of the gospel. You see, the gospel takes community seriously and it takes sin seriously. It's not a case of, hey, let's have unity and community at all costs. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you live your lives. It doesn't matter what you do with yourself. Let, let, let's just love one another. Let's have unity. Let's have community. Friends, how, how we, what we believe and how we live our lives matters. 
In the gospel, we see both a, a radical inclusivity that says, of all the nations, come. If anyone is thirsty, come. We, 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 we sang this morning, all who are thirsty. The gospel says, all who believe. The gospel is this great invitation that has gone throughout all the world and, and, and says it's not based on your economics, it's not based on your education, it's not based on your achievements. Just come. There's a radical inclusivity. But also there's this uncompromising exclusivity. Because it says unless you are born again, you will not enter into the kingdom. Yeah, he says, all come. But he says, you must be born again. Unless God himself has worked in you to transform and give you a new heart to put his spirit within you. Unless God himself comes and puts this imprint of his new identity. You can in no ways enter the kingdom. Listen, it's, it's, it's not how much you've attended church. It's not what your parents believed. It's not what good you have done, but it's being born again. There's this exclusivity. Each one of us must answer that question of who do you say I am? Who am I to you, says Christ. And in this passage, we see the problem of sin. And the gospel is the only message. In fact, it's the only power that can deal with the problem of sin. Because the gospel proclaims that Jesus Christ came and he paid the penalty, he paid the price for your sin and mine so that we might find forgiveness with God through faith in him. And so we are reconciled with God. The, our biggest problem is not alienation from one another, it's alienation with a holy God. As Jesus says, don't, don't fear the one who is able to kill the body. Fear the one who is able to kill the body and cast the soul into hell. And the gospel, the good news of the gospel proclaims that another has suffered, another has paid the price, and now forgiveness is offered freely to those who will believe. And what we have in this passage is an enactment of the gospel. You see, what we, what we have in this passage, this reconciliation, this forgiveness of sin, is not possible without the gospel. It's only possible in a community that has been formed by the gospel. And so Jesus is saying, I want your lives, I want your community to be a reenactment, a 3D illustration, life in technicolor of what the gospel is and does. I wonder what you think about, what comes to mind when we talk about church or the church community. I know when you talk about church, you might think of a building. But what comes to mind when you talk about church community? Do you think, well, that's, that sounds kind of boring, sounds restrictive, it sounds like people in my business monitoring how I'm living my life, kind of sounds outdated, not with it, sounds like it restricts me from living my best life and experiencing my best life now? Or maybe you think, well, no, I, I, I don't want anything to, to do with that. It's, it's a bunch of hypocrites. It's, it's a bunch of religious people. A lot of rules and rule keeping. Yet when we look at this story, Jesus envisions his church, this community, as a living 3D motion picture of the good news of his death on the cross. He, he envisions this living proof that Jesus has disciples, that there's still people following Jesus in our day and age. 
I know we, we love distributing Bibles. And it's great that people should have access to God's Word in a language they can understand and be able to read and grow. But Jesus wants us to, to give people more than just Bibles. He wants us to give them a living illustration of the power of the Scripture, of the power of the Gospel through how we relate to one another. This is what the church is. This is what church community is meant to be. I don't know what you're giving your life to. I don't know where church community is a priority on your list. But I, I want to charge you this morning not to give your life for anything less than this full 3D picture of the gospel in action. Now, you might be thinking, Cephas, that, that all sounds rosy, doesn't it? But you and I, we know that that's, that's easier said than done. I'm sure I could have any number of people here who would say, I've experienced more hurt in church community than anywhere else. And I believe in this passage we can see three reasons why being embedded, being entrenched, being wholeheartedly part of church community might be tough for you. The first one is because of people. I think, see, first, I would love church community. I, I would love to be this living 3D picture of the gospel except for the people. And again, this, this passage starts on the premise that somebody has sinned. And some versions of the Bible might say, sinned against you. The NASB just says, has sinned. It could be that it's against you or it's just sin in general. Someone has done something offensive. Somebody has missed the mark. They've offended you or offended many people. They've blown it one way or the other. And listen, while Jesus has won this decisive victory against sin, sin is not yet eradicated in our lives. Sin is still present with us. We, we haven't attained perfection yet. We haven't arrived. And we see it all too often in the church community. But if we're honest, this is not a problem that's just out there. It's, it's a problem that we carry within ourselves. Listen to a couple of scriptures. James 3, verse 2. It says, Indeed, we all make many mistakes. We all stumble in many ways. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I've had times when people have confronted me, even in the recent past, I'm on staff, I work two days a week for the church, and uh, last year at various points, I'd have some members of the staff taking me aside and see, saying, see, hey, you know, what you said in the meeting, it was just offside. Like, uh, you're cutting people off, you're not listening to people, you're minimizing other people's opinions. And I, I just had to take that on board. I even got a thick book like this on emotional intelligence. And as you can tell, I haven't read it yet. So, shying away from church community, shying away from people, doesn't really address the people problem because you're also part of the people problem. And all it does is to keep you entrenched and blind to your own blind spots. Can you imagine driving a car and covering all your blind spots with black, non-see-through film? Like, I, I just, it just riles me up. It, 
You know, you've got matatus coming on the left where they're not supposed to. You've got border borders coming. I, I hate seeing my blind spots. Friends, we, we can't afford to live life solo, outside of community. Now, a second reason why it might be tough for you to be in community is because it, it requires vulnerability. And how do we see it in this passage? Is that to be in community, you have to open yourself up to being sinned against. You, you have to give enough leeway, enough space for people to do things that will offend you. For people to do things that you will not like. And if we're honest, none of us want to be sinned against. None of us want to be offended. And so we might be there in the church, we might be there in life group, but actually we've got walls up. We've got barriers. And so we live these lives where we are protecting us. Nobody really knows you because it's a jungle out there. And you can't afford to show any weakness. You've watched the nature show. You've seen that it's, it's that antelope that kind of limbs shows any weakness. will be breakfast for the predator. And you've you decided at an early age that you are not going to be the breakfast. And this is Nairobi life, isn't it? I, I think it's the life of the big city. When, when we've all come from different places, we're, we're all here to, to make money. That's, that's why we're in Nairobi. Let's, let's just be honest. We're, I'm here to make money. If I wasn't here to make money, I wouldn't be kind of cooped up in that space. I'm, I'm here to make money. So you watch your business and let me watch mine. Every man for himself and God for us all. But you see, we, we need to be in a place of vulnerability. In fact, Jesus warns his disciples in Luke 12 verse 1. He says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What he's talking about is that they, they've, they've got a public persona and then they've got a private persona. Hypocrisy was this idea of, of acting, play acting, representing yourself as something that you're not. And when we don't open up to community, friends, we're all vulnerable to the yeast of the Pharisees. When, when people don't know you, it's like, who knows? <laughs> Nobody knows him. He's kind of here. She's kind of here. But we actually don't know what's, what's going on in the inner thought life. Nobody knows what's happening back at the ranch. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. And we might say we're protecting ourselves, but actually, it's not just about protecting ourselves. It's about doing what we want to do without anyone disturbing us. You know, sometimes... If you have kids, they'll, they'll go into... When they're really young, they're, they're not very good at keeping secrets and, and being naughty. So they, they look guilty. You can hear where they are. You can hear what they're doing. But they kind of try and separate themselves and hide themselves. But it's really easy to find them. And we always joke. Because what kids do out in the open is what adults do. Deep in our hearts. We just get better and better at hiding ourselves. So we've got two kids aged nine and six. For example, when they get food served, they're always trying and compete to see who's, which is the better plate. And that can cause a lot of problems. And they're always competing. Who's sitting on the best seat to watch the movie? Who's doing this best? It's just life is an endless competition. But when we grow older, we, we hide it. But inside, it's like, okay, who's driving the better car? Who's 
living in the better house, who's got better furniture, who seems to be having the better life. And friends, unless we open ourselves to community, and unless we open ourselves in vulnerability, we're living on a slippery slope. We're living with the lions that Michelle was talking about. Thinking that we can tame them, we can run this life solo, As the saying goes, the only lone ranger is a dead ranger. And especially when you're single, it's kind of like, let me me do my thing. I don't want people in my business. I don't don't want people to know who I'm dating. Why do you want to know who I'm dating? What, What business is that of yours? says that he who separates himself seeks his own desire. The wisdom of Proverbs says in the multitude of counselors, in many counselors, there is victory. And you might have had a a bad experience with being vulnerable, with, with opening yourself up. I remember when I was just a... Uh, in primary school, I used to have a friend and we used to play together. He would come to our house, I would go to his house. And then one day we were having one of those arguments and fights that kids have. And so when we had our arguments and fights, we would just say things to try and hurt each other. And then he said to me, that's why at your house you always eat ugali and skuma. Now you might have done high school here in Kenya and you're always eating githeri and you're thinking, oh, what's, what's wrong with that? But what he was saying is that, yeah, this, I've come to your house, I've seen that you guys, you, all you ever do is eat ugali and skuma. It's, it reflects upon you somehow. And it kind of stuck with me that if you open yourself up to people, they'll use things against you. And so I I don't want to be vulnerable. I I don't want to open myself up. I don't want people in my space. I don't want people to see my weaknesses. I I don't want people to see that our cultures are dirty most of the time. I, I, I don't want people to see that my wife and I don't agree all the time. I, I don't want people to see that sometimes our kids act up. It's it's hard parenting. I don't want people to know that sometimes there's more months at the end of my budget. I want to live life solo. But you know, when you're in prison and you misbehave, the worst punishment they can think of is to put you in solitary confinement. That's Because we're created to be relational beings. When Adam and Eve were created, the Bible says that they were naked and unashamed. Now listen, I'm not advocating to start nudist life groups. But what I'm talking about is this idea that they had full exposure. That they knew each other completely and they accepted one another. We are designed to be in deep accepting relationships. We're designed to be vulnerable, to know and be known, to love and be loved. And friends, while being vulnerable is a great risk, it's kind of the aspect of risk and reward. It takes great risk to get great reward. And there's no greater reward that you can get than being fully known and fully loved, to, to be accepted for who you are. And this is why in one tribe we, we talk about our values. I loved that um, Catherine spoke about two values last week and I just wanted to talk about three values that we have. There's authenticity. And this is our booklet that you'll be doing when you come for Pomoja. If you haven't done that, I really recommend that you do that. And this is what we say. With us, what you see is what you get. 
What's on the box is what's inside the box. We allow one another to see the worst of us. And we allow one another to see the best of us. In this family, you're free to be who God made you to be. This is not a church where you are loved and not known, or worse, known and not loved, but a church where you can be fully known and fully loved. So friends, vulnerability is not optional. If we're to live out this value of authenticity. Another reason why you might, it might be tough for you to be in church communities because it takes work. I mean, you read this passage, Jesus says, if somebody sins against you, like, I'm not ready for that. I'm not ready for anyone to sin against me. Step one, stop. Then he says, no, go and speak to them, just the two of you. And you're like, what? I now have to speak to them? I, I don't even like them. And now you're asking me to go and speak to this person about what? I hate confrontation. If you're anything like me, I hate confrontation. Then I'm married to somebody who loves confrontation. Like, no, I, I hate confrontation. And then you're like, no, it's okay, I've, I've, I've done it, they haven't agreed. Now I'll go and take two other people. And like, I've got a full-time job. I've got a family. I, I don't have time for this. Then after that, bring it to the church. Like, oh my goodness, I don't even like speaking up front. I don't, I like just to sit at the back. I come in last, I go out first. Now you want me to bring this issue before the church. Community takes too much work. Yet Jesus says, look, being out of community is unthinkable. It's, there's no opt-out button. There's, there's no out of community option. When we read verse 17, it says that, listen, if, if this person refuses to listen to you, refuses to listen to the church, treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. And you might think, is, is this Jesus being... A segregationist, is, is he saying some people are better than others? No, no, he's, he's saying treat them as somebody who's not part of the church community. In fact, we know how Jesus used to treat Gentiles and tax collectors. He was known as a friend of sinners and tax collectors. That's, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about protecting the integrity of this radically inclusive yet uncompromisingly exclusive community. Paul spoke about it as delivering someone to the devil. And so it's amazing that in our day, followers of Jesus are volunteering, voluntarily opting out of church community, voluntarily going into solitary confinement. Friends, that's, that's self-inflicted torture. Commenting on this, 19th century commentator J.C. Rao says this, there's a solemn rebuke in these words, for all who neglect the public worship of God. And it's, it's not just the public worship, it's, it's this community, this family that God calls us into. They turn their back on the society of the Lord of Lords. They miss the opportunity of meeting Christ himself. It avails nothing to say that as much good is got by staying at home, I'll, I'll just follow the message online, I'll I will follow T.D. Jakes. I'll, I'll listen to Mike Todd. I, I will listen to Matt Chandler. Come on, I'll, I'll just be at home. I'll do this thing solo. The words of our Lord should silence such arguments at once. Friends, Jesus leaves no eject button from the church community. Opting out of community is not an option. And so this is why, as one tribe, we call everyone to the various expressions of community that we have. We want people to be regularly being part of our gatherings on a Sunday, not just being part of the gathering, serving in one way as you're embedded in a team of, of people who know you and who, who, who love you. And when we talk about serving regularly on a Sunday, sometimes it feels like we are playing musical church. You know, musical chairs, where you stand up, you dance, and then you sit on the next chair. It's kind of like for some regular attendance means you'll see me once a month or you'll see me once every three months. 
And in extreme cases, you see me on Easter and on Christmas. This is what we're not talking about. We're talking about being regularly together week after week, being embedded in the community. This is why we want everybody to be in a life group. This is a small group that meets during the week or on a Sunday or whatever day you choose and where you can be truly known, where you can be truly loved, where your gifts can be explored. And I found what this commentator said super helpful. It's a bit of a long passage, but I'll just read it. It says, It is very hard, the sociologists remind us, to relate effectively to more than 150 people. Therefore, members of larger churches are in great danger of being undercared for. Access to the minister is rare, the leaders are busy, contact gets increasingly shallow, people become increasingly frustrated. Nobody in leadership really knows them, what their needs are, and what gifts they could contribute to the church. Therefore, it is imperative to break the congregation down into small, caring units, fellowship groups, where love is the universal language, where the dozen or so people in the group meet regularly for enjoyment, Bible study, prayer over each other's needs, celebration, and acts of service. Such groups are a marvelous substructure in any church. And so, friends, life group is not an option. This is where you can know and be known. Love and be loved. Be cared for. This is where you can care for, uh, for others, where you can obey the one another scriptures that the New Testament epistles give. And so while it might be tough for you, it requires courage. It requires for us to embrace authenticity, to embrace a life where we honor one another by accepting and bringing one another into one another's lives. And Jesus just doesn't leave us with no option. Doesn't, he just doesn't say, hey, just grit your, tits, grit your teeth until I come. Just hold on. Just be stoic. In fact, in this passage, we see incredible promises on community. He says, truly, I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. And the first promise that's kind of embedded in that passage is that God works through the church community. We see this idea that God has given the church community authority to represent heaven. On earth, he says, Whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And the way the, the verbs are is that actually the binding on earth is a representation of what has already been bound in heaven. And what he's saying there is that this church community, remember the, the context is having come to the church and the church adjudicating, is that the church represents heaven on earth. That the church is meant to be an outpost of heaven on earth. The church is meant to represent heaven on earth. And so when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for these expressions of heavenly communities to fill the earth. Not only that, we see this powerful promise that if two of you agree on anything about, about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. And Jesus is saying that, even the prayers released in the community, there's a blessing that comes on the prayers of community. And so when we talk about being in church community, it's, it's not just about being kind of safe, loving one another, being cared for. It's about actually God expressing his heart on earth through a people that belongs to him. This has always been God's purpose, that his kingdom would be expressed through his people. And now it is through the church, now through the church, that his manifest wisdom, his multifaceted wisdom is being expressed not just to people but to rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. 
God has chosen that his activities will be through the church. You might think, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a minister of the gospel. I've got this ministry that God has given to me. I'm, I'm out there. I'm expressing the kingdom of God through this thing that I'm doing or through this thing that I'm involved in. And, and that's all well and good. God does place different things on different lives, but he, he's calling us not just to be out there as solo ministers, but to be out there as a community that is expressing his purposes. It's through the church. It's through the local church. The visible community of the invisible community. And while this passage is about mediating and restoring relationship, it can apply to anything. For example, as a church, if you've been a part of us for any length of time, you'll, you'll know that we are feeling this call of God upon our lives to be serving orphans and vulnerable children. That we, we feel God has placed it on our hearts that the church is the answer to, to be that family, to live out the gospel, this gospel that says God has adopted you, that you are an alien and a stranger, and God adopted you into his family, and he has given you his spirit, and, he, and you now call him Abba, Daddy, that we are to live out that gospel by, by bringing in the orphan, by, by seeing the orphans placed in loving, Christ-centered, gospel-centered homes. And that as we do that, as a church, we are expressing the will of heaven, the will of the Father who says he's a father to the fatherless. In effect, we're saying that what we bind on earth is, has been already been bound in heaven. When we, when we say fatherlessness, it's not meant to be. It's not the expression of heaven. It's, it's, it's not what life is meant to be. We are expressing the heart of God. When we say that the church should be the answer, we are expressing the heart of God. We are not saying to God, this is what we want to do. Would you please bless it? But in effect, we are saying, this is what God, this is who he is. This is what he says. This is his nature. This is his character. And we want to see it expressed through the life of the church. And so when, when we gather and pray into God's purposes, there's a power. There's a blessing of God. He says, how... How wonderful it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the anointing oil, the, the consecrating oil, that beautiful, dedicated oil that dripped on Aaron the high priest. How beautiful it is when we gather together in unity as a church on a Sunday and in our life groups. It says that God commands a blessing. This is the promise of God that he works through the church community. Finally, we, we see Jesus when he says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. This wonderful promise of his presence that Jesus himself would be present in and through the community. Again, this commentator Michael Green he says that the rabbis had a saying, when 10 people sit together and occupy themselves with the Torah, that is the law, the Shekinah, that is God's manifest presence, abides amongst them. You see, in that day, it took 10 Jewish men to form a synagogue. And the encouragement they had from the rabbis is that when, when you sit in that synagogue, they would gather together to study the scriptures, that God himself was amongst them. Now Jesus replaces the Torah by himself. When disciples are gathered praying in the name of the Messiah, he is in their midst. The Shekinah shines amongst them and from them. Friends, this, this is the, the great promise of our community. This is the great promise of church community. This is the great promise of when we gather together on a Sunday, when we gather together during the week, when we gather together wherever we might be. Jesus himself promises to be powerfully present among us. And I want to close on that 
just invite the band to come back up. Just to remind us what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. We've been talking about growing. What it means for you to grow and mature as a believer. Listen, you might not know the exact details of God's plan for your life, but I can tell you, I'm 100% sure that God's plan for you is that you would grow and mature in your faith. You can bank that. That God hasn't called you to be stagnant and maybe you might be here and you'd say, hey, if I'm honest, I've kind of felt stagnant. I've felt like I've plateaued in my faith. And this morning I, I want to assure you that God's plan is that you continue to grow and to bear fruit. And maybe you've been going through a season of pruning. Maybe you felt that you're stagnant, but actually you're not stagnant. God has been pruning you. It's, it's been a, a change of season. It's been God working something new in your life and He's saying you're, you're not overlooked. There's nothing wrong with you. I'm actually preparing you for greater fruitfulness ahead. And for some of you, you need to agree to his pruning. You need to agree to let go of some things. And the Lord is saying, hey, we, we, we can't move forward with those things still in your life. We've come to the point of decision. And actually, I, it's not that I want to withhold good from you. It's not that I want to keep you from enjoyment. But I know what it is that you need. Is the gardener who knows what the plant needs for it to bear fruit. Is the gardener who knows what kind of fruit he wants you to produce. And for you this morning, it's a time of saying, I trust the vine dresser. I trust that outside of the vine, I can do nothing. I trust that it is your purpose that I should bear much fruit and fruit that will last for eternity. But friends, we, we can't grow in isolation. Community is the soil. It's the medium that keeps us anchored. It's the medium through which God himself feeds us and grows us. Jesus is serious about community. He says, I am building my church. I will build my church. And this morning, he's inviting you and asking, will you raise community a few notches higher on your priority list? Are you, are you willing to sacrifice a little bit that you might love others? And maybe you've been hurt in the past when you've been vulnerable. And Jesus knows all about being hurt in vulnerability. Jesus was betrayed by one of his 12 closest friends. It was one who dipped his bread with him. One whom he opened himself up to. But listen, that was the way for our salvation. It was through his vulnerability, through his betrayal, through his death upon that cross that you and I could stand this morning and celebrate that gospel, that you and I this morning can have any hope of living out the gospel. And you might think, well, I don't want to be hurt. It's much bigger than you. God is working His purposes through your life for the blessing of the families of the earth. Are you willing to join Jesus to pick up your cross, to deny yourself and follow Him on that road to vulnerability, on that road of being open to community, on that road of doing life with others? And friends, we are not alone. We've got the great promises that He is active and works through community. That when two or three are gathered in His name, 
He himself is with us. Let's stand together and we'll pray and we'll sing one last song. And listen, if, if you're feeling like you need prayer from anything that has gone on this morning, whether during the time of singing, whether through the message, I invite you just to come forward and we'll have people here to pray with you, people here to stand with you, people here to just love on you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us to be a people who belong to you. You have called us from the nations that we should be a new nation, a holy people, your own nation that belongs to you, a bride for the sun, a dwelling place for your spirit. Oh God, this is incredible. Thank you that you take community seriously, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you love your church. Thank you that you're present through your church. Thank you that you're active in and through your church. And so as a church community, we want to dedicate ourselves to you this morning. We want to give ourselves over to your purposes and say, Lord, would you work through our community even as you will. Amen.